The uh, committee will come to order. Is uh, Mr. Lantos, uh, there he is. See his smiling face. Uh, unless there's an objection, uh, I, I don't see a need for opening statements. We've already had opening statements. So Mr. Free, I see you're ready to ready to go. Sir. Do you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Okay. In accordance with uh, the motion that was made earlier, uh, there will be 30 minutes on each side, but I've talked to Mr. Lantos, and rather than go with the second uh, hour being split in 10-minute segments, we'll go straight to the five-minute rule to try to expedite uh, the hearing. And uh, Director Free will try to get as much done tonight as possible. I hate to have you come back tomorrow, but uh, it's just one of those things. Yeah, no, it's it. no problem, sir. Okay, Mr. Bennett. Oh, I'm sorry, your opening statement. You have an opening statement you'd like to uh, I believe the read? director has an opening statement you'd like to make, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, if I could, sir. Absolutely. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> I'll try to go through it quickly. I'll submit it for the record in its entirety. Uh, let me just say I do appreciate the opportunity to appear here today. I have immense uh, respect for this committee, for you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Lantos, and I'm very happy to appear and, uh, and answer as many of your questions as I can. Um, what is uh, being discussed here is uh, both uh, uh, simple and complex. The simple part of it is that the Attorney General uh, did ask me with respect to the independent counsel matter uh, what my advice would be, and I furnished that to her in confidence as I've given her uh, much advice over four and a half years. Um, the more complex issues are the uh, specific of that advice and the obvious differences uh, between the oversight function and the investigative function, which um, are different in kind as well as in degree. Uh, prior to the hearing, as you know, uh, not in any public way have I discussed the specific recommendation which I made to the Attorney General. Uh, that has been uh, my decision and uh, not her decision. Uh, I feel very strongly that I, as well as future FBI directors, uh, should be free to give honest and sensitive advice to the Attorney General, particularly in matters of uh, criminal investigation. Um, so I do have reservations in even making that recommendation uh, public today, although uh, it's probably the worst kept uh, secret uh, in Washington. Before I do that, however, I do want to talk about what I think are the serious uh, implications and the issues involved when uh, an FBI director is asked to make public that recommendation, which, uh, which I will certainly do uh, today. When we conduct investigations, we must ensure that uh, people's rights, uh, as well as the ongoing investigation, uh, is not damaged or undermined. Um, it is uh, best that information with the strong potential, particularly to be misunderstood or misinterpreted, uh, be disclosed only uh, in exceptional matters relating to this type of an issue. But because there has been widespread uh, reporting, and I deplore the leaks of that reporting with respect to what I recommended, and only after discussing this with the Attorney General uh, and many other people, uh, am I willing to disclose what I believe should always be, at least in the context of an ongoing criminal investigation, a matter of confidence uh, between an investigator uh, and the chief prosecutor, in this case, my boss, the attorney general. Uh, I do not believe, however, it is appropriate for me to go beyond uh, what that specific recommendation was to explain uh, why I made it on the basis of what facts, uh, for what reason, uh, would require me to discuss uh, not just a grand jury investigation, but the theory of the investigation, which I certainly would not want any potential subjects to hear, even if they think they could figure it out themselves. Uh, I also think that uh, providing those kinds of details would do great damage to the relationship between attorney generals and FBI directors, and maybe for uh, many years to come. Your committee, Mr. Chairman, has a uh, deep and abiding respect for the principles inherent in our criminal justice system, and nothing uh, that I would say today would I ever intend and nor would anyone here intend to violate any of the due process or the privacy rights of individuals who become uh, the subject of inquiry. 
To the contrary, we take great comfort in the care with which you, Mr. Chairman, personally and the committee have handled uh, very sensitive foreign counterintelligence information that we have been providing to this committee. And we are very um, confident in that relationship and in the uh, high uh, responsible manner in which that's been handled. Let me just explain that my reasons uh, and my concern in not discussing fully my recommendation is not based on any fear of scrutiny or uh, openness. Uh, we must be mindful, obviously, that there's a pending criminal investigation. That has not changed. Uh, investigation to which uh, all of this res relates, uh, in most cases, uh, we don't even confirm, as you know, the existence of criminal investigations. Mr. Bennett, you were a distinguished U.S. attorney for many years. It's been the long practice of Department of Justice officials not to even disclose the existence of an investigation. The reasons for that are simple. We have a dual obligation to conduct an investigation, but also to protect the rights and the reputations of people who are in many cases exonerated. Um, so for those reasons, over the course of many months, uh, despite uh, reports of what my recommendation was or was not, I have uh, refused to publicly comment about any aspect of the investigation, including the legal issues relating to the independent counsel statute. I have been particularly concerned that uh, my comments could be understood. People could believe that I have reached some findings or conclusions of fact with respect to whether someone has committed a crime or done anything improper, uh, which is not the case. And I know, Mr. Chairman, that uh, you and your many colleagues uh, fully understand the nuances of the legal counsel statute. Many people do not. And if they were to hear what the recommendations of an FBI director were, they could misinterpret and misconstrue uh, what actually is the process here, which is a process of consideration rather than a process of fact-finding per se. In recommending to the Attorney General that an independent counsel be appointed, I did not and do not believe that any particular person has committed a crime. Uh, or is a target of a grand jury, or even has done anything improper. I recommend an appointment of an independent counsel to investigate whether crimes may have been committed, uh, but nothing more should be inferred from that recommendation. I surely don't think that you or any other member of the committee wants an FBI director who publicly talks about evidence that relates to individuals, either charged or uncharged, who discloses theories of investigation, who discloses matters before a grand jury, or names people who either are being investigated or have, who have chosen to assist the government in our investigation. Ignoring for a moment the certain harm to the investigation such disclosures would cause, it also, in my view, violates the basic notions of due process, privacy, fundamental fairness, and the presumption of innocence. I know, Mr. Chairman, of your deep and abiding respect for these principles principles that are at the very heart of our criminal justice system. Those values undoubtedly would be harmed, in my view, if either the Attorney General or I discuss what underlies our recommendations or our differences as a matter of law. I've stated many times my respect for Attorney General Reno. In the four and one quarter years we have worked together, I've seen her bring nothing but integrity and honesty to the table. In this instance, she asked for my recommendation. I strongly believe she's entitled to seek and receive the best judgment and unvarnished opinions of her subordinates, which is me. And that is what I gave her here. We certainly should think long and hard before we created a precedent or a notion uh, that some future FBI director not myself, would hesitate when it came to giving his boss the frank and honest recommendations uh, that he or she requested. Everybody in the FBI understands that the decision here was the Attorney General's decision, hers alone, not mine. I don't question that and have never understood anything to the contrary. That I made a recommendation different from the ultimate outcome in this instance does not even mean there is a professional rift between us. It merely means we disagree on a matter of law, a judgment about a legal issue. Prosecutors and investigators, I've been both, often do disagree. That two lawyers disagree should not be surprising. When I was a district court judge, 
No district court judge likes to get reversed. But when I did get reversed, it was always better to be reversed three to nothing than three to one or two to one. Uh, because there was always the assumption uh, that everybody was going to read the law and the facts just like we had on the district court bench. As Mr. Lantos pointed out, uh, we frequently have five, four decisions coming from our court. We rarely have nine uh, to zero decisions. On issues of fact, the Attorney General and I do not disagree. I can assure you, Mr. Chairman, that the FBI is not being impeded in any way in conducting our investigation. No investigative avenues have been closed, and nothing has changed in that regard as a result of the decision last Tuesday. The task force was formed last December. They are marching orders from both myself and the Attorney General are to go wherever the evidence leads them. The FBI has dedicated nearly 100 people to this task force. We're using our people all over the world to investigate and gather evidence. We've done 1,100 interviews. We've conducted uh, conducted and more than a thousand subpoenas have been issued while candidly there have been some problems during the investigation and having done this for 23 years I never had an investigation that didn't have problems I am confident that this task force is focused and following a methodical investigative strategy mr. chairman I've been in government service for 23 years I've served every attorney general since Edward Levy I have been an investigator, a prosecutor, and a judge. I follow a couple of simple rules. I fully and fairly investigate all the matters within my jurisdiction. I take the evidence wherever it follows, wherever it, wherever it takes me. I let the chips fall where they may. And I protect the rights of the guilty subjects as well as those who may be exonerated after our investigation. I'll make sure that I continue doing that in this case. When I gave my recommendation to the Attorney General, my sole objective was to give her what she asked for, my candid analysis, conclusions, and recommendation. Every Attorney General is entitled to that from the FBI Director. I am obligated, I believe, to provide my views in an absolutely nonpartisan manner. That is why you, the Congress, gave the FBI Director a 10-year term, to give me the freedom to do so without concern about those views either outside or within the criminal justice system. I have a dual obligation in all of my investigations. I have to conduct a full and fair inquiry. I have to protect the integrity of the investigation, the relationship that not just I enjoy with the Attorney General, but the relationship that FBI agents all over the world and all over the country enjoy with their prosecutors. I have to protect the rights of the innocent. I have to protect the reputations of those who may be exonerated. It's a difficult balance, and in this particular case, because of your very appropriate oversight responsibilities and the fact that we have an active, comprehensive criminal investigation, uh, there are areas, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, where we cannot uh, share and discuss things uh, as fully as we might do if this was a closed investigation. Uh, again, I very much appreciate the opportunity of appearing before this committee, and I'll be happy to try to answer as many questions as I can. Uh, we are dispensing with any opening statements uh, since we've already made those earlier. Uh, Mr. Bennett will start the questioning, and then I will. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Lantos. May I ask a friendly question or raise a point of order? Uh, you can do either at this point. Well, let me first ask a friendly question. Okay. <clears throat> when we agreed on the procedures you and I will be following here earlier. Mm -hmm. Our understanding on the Democratic side was that, uh, and that's exactly what we did with the Attorney General, that uh, there will be uh, an initial time allocation to the Republican members and then to the Democratic members, then we alternate. Right. We did not have any staff questioning. I think. I think it is incredible that with the, the Attorney General here and uh, the Director of the FBI here, elected members of Congress are not given an opportunity to proceed with their questions on both sides. I have no objections to Mr. Bennett as an individual. I think he's a very able person, but I think uh, this hearing should be conducted 
by the members, and uh, I will be more than happy to have, obviously, have you as the chairman proceed with your questions. But I have objections to staff asking questions before members do. Well, we have done that in the past, but in this particular case, since we have the head of the FBI here, I will uh, accede to your wishes, and uh, uh, I may call you Louis briefly. Louis, uh, Certainly. I, will, I will ask you uh, the questions that we have uh, before us. Uh, first of all, let me, let me talk about, and you can start the clock. You, let, me, let me talk to you about something that I discussed with the Attorney General earlier. Uh, and I don't believe I'm violating any secret meeting. I think that this is something that, that can be discussed, especially since she brought it up today. Uh, back, I believe, in February, and I have a, a document here I think was given to us. This is not a secret document. It, it, it was attached to a secret document. And it was in response to uh, the Deputy Attorney General's request to answer questions submitted by <coughs> Charles Ruff, Counsel of the President. And the comment was, it says, Louis, if the memorandum leaks, it will put the FBI in a negative light since certain members of the White House are currently under investigation while we are providing the White House counsel with, or would be providing the White House counsel with background information on the PRC political fund, fund, funding issue. Now, you told me, I believe, along with your staff when we met, that uh, uh, you told the Justice Department that you didn't think this information should be given to the White House. Subsequent to that, you went to Egypt. And while you were in Egypt, I believe it was uh, Mr. Bryant, I'm not sure exactly who it was, was summoned to the Justice Department by, I can't remember who the, Ms. Karelik, uh, who was the Chief Deputy to Attorney General Reno and said that they wanted the information which you said you didn't think should be given to the White House. Your uh, deputy, I believe it was Mr. Bryant, then took the information over there to Mr. Kralik and uh, the Attorney General. And on his return, as he was returning, he conveyed to me, I believe you were present, he conveyed to me that uh, he thought, well, we'd better talk to Louis first about, we better talk to Louis about this because he didn't want this to go to the White House because of some of the implications involved. Uh, they then called you in Egypt and you were, according to the reports, were very upset, and uh, you then contacted the Attorney General, who, after you contacted her, uh, concurred with what you said, and, and uh, to our knowledge, the information was not then sent to the White House. Is that the way it happened? Yes, sir. That's correct. We had uh, discussed this information prior to my trip to Egypt, and we had agreed that um, the material would not be briefed to the White House because of my concern about the potential uh, aspect of um, individuals learning about it uh, while it was an active inquiry. And that was agreed, and the, uh, the call that I made to the Attorney General was in response to my deputy telling me that there was now a movement to brief the information to the White House. The, fact, the bottom line was it was never briefed to the White House. The, the uh, Attorney General, and I'm not trying to drive a wedge between anybody, contrary to what some people may think, but the Attorney General indicated you in Egypt, and your deputy told us at that meeting that he was concerned about what he had done, and that's why he called you in Egypt, and then you called her back. I just want to get that straight. You did, you did initiate the call to the Attorney General from Egypt. Bob Bryant reached out for me. We had a discussion on a secure phone about what... Um, what was going on, and I called the Attorney General. Thank you. Uh, I won't pursue that any further. I think we've, we've covered that enough, but uh, uh, it, 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 it did trouble me at the time, and it troubles me now that the Chief Deputy to the Attorney General, uh, after and the Attorney General, after having been told you didn't think this information should be given to the White House, uh, in your absence, asked for the information, for what reason I know not, and then the, after the information was given to them, uh, there was some concern about it getting to the White House. That troubled me then. It troubles me now. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, you and the Attorney General, as law enforcement officials atop in this country, should be uh, uh, not respecting anybody, me, the President, or anyone else, as far as the administration of justice is concerned, 
And when you think something like that shouldn't be given to the White House, and in your absence there's a reversal of a decision that has been made, it, it, it is troubling. If, if I could just add, as a result of that, um, of, of that series of events, we did put into place the Attorney General I a process whereby uh, we have to be consulted before any matters even remotely relating to this investigation are briefed to the NSC or anyone else in the executive branch. And that is, it, to my mind, worked very well so far. So that would be a joint decision? Yes. And if I have an objection to it, we would sit down and discuss it. I see. Okay. Uh, in her opening statement, uh, Ms. Reno state, uh, stated a number of times that she based her decision on the evidence and the law. Uh, you also looked at the evidence and the law when you made your decision, didn't you, Mr. Free? Yes, sir. And looking at exactly the same facts and law as the Attorney General, you reached the opposite conclusion that an independent counsel should be appointed in this case. I recommend that an independent counsel should be appointed, but obviously we're looking at the same facts and the same law. As director of the FBI, you've had access to the facts developed during the Justice Department's investigation. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. When you made your recommendation to the Attorney General, did you take the section of the independent counsel statute which deals with conflicts into account section 592? I took that into account, yes, sir. Did you conclude that the Attorney General had such a conflict of interest in this case that she could not credibly conduct this investigation? Again, I just would respectfully like to uh, report to you certainly the recommendation that I've uh, disclosed, but not discuss the bases or the means that go beyond that recommendation. Once I do that, I think I start to get into the areas of the uh, facts and not the law, but the facts that um, I feel constrained not to do. Well, the, the only reason I bring that up is not to put you in an, in an untenable situation, but there is some question about whether or not the conflict of interest provision in Section 592 uh, uh, should trigger the appointment of an independent counsel and, and, and eliminate the, even the appearance of impropriety or possible appearance of impropriety. And that's why I'm asking that question because you as the director of the FBI uh, must have had some concern about that. I certainly had some concern about it uh, to the point where I did make the recommendation that I made, which was a, a carefully considered one, only a recommendation. I based it as you noted on the facts and the law and uh, I gave her my best judgment. But your determination was based in part then on Section 592. I made the recommendation on more than one basis. Was that part of it? Um, again, I'd rather not get into the particulars of what part of the statute uh, I made it on or didn't make well, it on. It's fair to say that I made my recommendation on more than one basis. But I, I'd prefer not to go the, beyond the, the, that. The questions I'm asking you, uh, Mr. Free, is, is not one that would be in any way construed to impede your investigation or be uh, causing a problem with grand jury testimony or the secrecy provisions of the grand jury. So I, I don't understand why you, you, you can't answer that question, whether or not 592 was a part of your decision. Well, again, with, with great respect, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm not so much concerned that an answer to that question would uh, violate any portion of the grand jury evidence in this case. I am very concerned that the answer to that question and a more comprehensive response will start very seriously to uh, impede the relationship that directors have and should have with their attorney general, both this one and, and, and those to come. So I respectfully ask that I not be required to give the specific bases. I, I, I think I can report to you that I made the recommendation on more than one basis. I think that's a, a pretty comprehensive answer. Did you conclude that the Attorney General uh, had such a conflict of interest in this case that she could not credibly conduct this investigation in a general sense, the appearance of uh, a conflict? I don't think I could make any conclusion as to what someone else would have or not have as a conflict. Uh, I think what I did is I gave my recommendation uh, based on what I understood the facts and the law to be. But a conflict, as you know, is a, uh, is a very subjective uh, calculation. And 
whether it's personal or political under the statute, it requires the person charged with that decision, which is the Attorney General, to evaluate that. And what I said was what I would do and what my recommendation was. When uh, uh, I talked to your counsel and my counsel talked to your counsel uh, recently, we were trying to work out uh, arrangements so that we could see a redacted copy of the uh, memo one that would not jeopardize the grand jury investigation or in any way give anybody an indication of uh, where you were going with your investigation. Uh, you appeared uh, and your counsel appeared to try to, uh, to at least want to try to work that out so we could get a redacted copy. Did you talk to the attorney general or her counsel about trying to get us a redacted copy? Yes. <clears throat> yes, we spoke about that uh, yesterday after our meeting. If you read the last paragraph of the letter that we sent uh, yesterday, which I asked to be included. Uh, we do suggest that uh, after the hearings, there still uh, would uh, perhaps remain questions about the uh, contents and specifics. And um, I've suggested that without uh, either the Congress or the executive waiving any of its uh, privileges or rights, it would make sense for uh, people of goodwill as we are here to sit down and, and see whether there are some things that can be uh, distributed. But that's ultimately uh, the Attorney General's decision. So you suggested to the Attorney General and her counsel that we get a redacted copy or at least ne negotiate to get a redacted copy of the memo? That we negotiate that and uh, that our lawyers sit down. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Did uh, the Attorney General or the Justice Department write the letter to which you attached your signature? Uh, they drafted the letter, but they sent it over. We reviewed it, and as I said, I, uh, I ensured that the last paragraph reflected uh, what I had discussed yesterday with the Attorney General, which is keeping the door open to have our lawyers uh, discuss this matter. Well, what, 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 uh, what changes did you make in the letter aside from the last paragraph? That's the only one I'm aware of. So the letter was drafted and written by the Justice Department, and you, you signed it? Well, my general counsel spent, unfortunately, most of yesterday we're going through different drafts of it, so... We had a lot of input into it. Thank you, sir. Okay. Were you in attendance at the final meeting uh, where the Attorney General made the decision not to appoint an independent counsel? I don't know that I was. I had a, a conversation with the Attorney General Tuesday morning. Uh, this was uh, following many discussions over the period of uh, uh, several uh, weeks or months. Uh, whether she had subsequent meetings after that, and I believe she probably did. I was not present at those meetings. Did she discuss with you in any, in any way the other people with whom she was conferring about her decision? No, not by name or not specifically. I knew she had received memos from other people, and uh, she certainly received ours. The Attorney General's decision not to appoint an independent counsel was based solely on the phone calls made by the President and the Vice President. Isn't that true? Yes, that's what her filing to the court reports. Is it uh, your understanding that any lines of inquiry have been closed down? No, sir. As far as I understand, as far as the Attorney General and I discussed, and as she has said publicly, there is no area of this case which is closed to the, uh, to the investigation. The reason I ask that question is Vice President Gore, and I, pres I asked this question of the Attorney General earlier, Vice President Gore indicated that he was glad this was behind him and there was, uh, that the investigation was over, but that was not an, a correct statement because your investigation, wherever it leads, is still continuing and is sanctioned and supported by the Attorney General. Our investigation is continuing as, as she described it to you this morning. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, would you yield just for a clarification on that point? I'd be happy to yield to my colleague. Uh, my understanding of the Chairman's question is that there are no other lines of inquiry that are not open, but uh, I believe that we're all in agreement that there will be no further investigation into the phone calls by the Vice President uh, and by the President. Is that your understanding? It's not my understanding. There is, there is an ongoing with respect to the, the phone calls? With respect to the Attorney General's decision as to those transactions as they relate to uh, two covered individuals under one specific statute, that as a legal matter has been resolved. The transactions themselves, as they may be part of other activities, is still an open part of an inquiry. Uh, I'll yield back, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, if I might, with one further question. Is there an ongoing investigation into the phone calls? Well, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't characterize it as into the phone calls to the extent that but, but the... To the extent that that's a transaction. Yes. Uh, I want to know whether or not there is going to be more investigation of that transaction. 
With respect to the phone calls as transactions, those remain uh, an open part of the inquiry. So there, there is an investigation ongoing uh, into the phone calls? Yes, I wouldn't characterize it as an investigation into the phone calls, but the transactions, along with many other transactions, uh, are part of uh, what is still an open uh, inquiry. Well, the chairman's been generous with his time. I, I'm sufficiently confused. I may need to come back to this. Thank you. I, is it uh, your, uh, also your understanding that the Attorney General's decision did not take into account anyone's knowledge at the White House or the DNC of illegal foreign money coming into the DNC? She sa stated this morning that it was specifically limited to the 607 issues. Uh, Mr. Free, over 65 people have invoked the Fifth Amendment or fled the country in the course of the committee's investigation. Have you ever experienced so many unavailable witnesses in any matter in which you've prosecuted or in which you've been involved? Um, actually, I have. You have? Um, give, me a, give me a rundown on that real quickly. I spent about uh, 16 years doing organized crime cases in New York City, and many people were frequently unavailable. So the, was that the only time you experienced something like that? Went on for quite a while. So the only time <laughs> that you experienced anything like this was when you were investigating an organized crime syndicate. There have been cases, certainly, you asked me about my experience. Where I understand. I'm just pulling your leg yeah. here a little bit. Does it concern you that a number of individuals who have taken the fifth or fled the country were associates of the president? For instance, Webb, Hubble, Mark, Middleton, and so forth? What Charles concerns Green. me here, Mr. Chairman, are any facts which uh, are certainly relevant to an inquiry, any facts which uh, are evidence, any facts upon which we can make determinations either to charge or not charge, refer or not refer. Um, I don't think any specific event or individual uh, should be highlighted. I don't think that would be fair to them for me to do that here, but uh, I am interested in anything related to our inquiry, which is very broad ranging. Well, essentially, essentially then, uh, your opinion with respect to the appointment of an independent counsel is based on the appearance of a conflict of interest involving the individuals who may have had contact with the president. The recommendation was made on more than one single basis. But this was one of them. Well, I, I, I prefer to just let that answer stand where it is. It does cover, I believe, your, your question. In your investigation of figures like John Wong, Charlie Tree, and Johnny Chung, does it concern you that these individuals are able to gain access to the highest levels of the Clinton administration, some on a pretty regular basis? Again, what concerns me is, is not access or lack of access. What concerns me is whether anybody who's a subject of this investigation, there are many subjects, uh, many of whom will be exonerated, I think, at the end of the day. But what concerns me is anything they done, they've done or may have done which violates the law and which uh, should result in some grand jury action by some prosecutor. In uh, this situation, is it your opinion that uh, the appointment of an independent counsel is entirely within the spirit and letter of the law? If you're asking me whether I think my recommendation had a sound basis in law and fact, I believe it did, sir. Uh, Mr. Free, there was discussion between, pardon me, oh, I'm sorry. As to uh, FBI special agents assigned to the task force, do those agents uh, report to task force attorneys or the FBI headquarters or field office supervisors? I think it's fair to say they certainly report to their FBI supervisors, the inspector in charge. They regularly uh, speak to, in fact, they uh, cohabitate the task force space with uh, prosecutors and attorneys. They also have reporting obligations, as does the chief investigator there, Mr. DeSarno, directly back to me and my deputies. Uh, so they report to the FBI. They certainly work, uh, discuss, and uh, relay information to the prosecutors. Well, have, have you ever seen uh, uh, any of the press reports reporting frustration of FBI agents that were assigned to the task force? For example, if you look in this week's issue of Time Magazine, there's some FBI agents that expressed uh, some concern about uh, uh, their frustration with uh, being limited uh, in having access to certain people. I'm, I'm certainly, certainly aware of those, uh, those stories. Uh, have you talked to any of your agents who have expressed this kind of uh, frustration? We discuss on a, on a regular basis, in fact, on a weekly basis, the conduct of the investigation, uh, where we're proceeding, whether or not uh, it's proceeding in the direction 
that uh, we believe it should be, uh, whether uh, uh, witnesses are being contacted promptly, whether subpoenas are being returned. Uh, and yes, from time to time, uh, investigators have, have expressed frustration with the, uh, with the pace of things, with developments, uh, and well, that's a regular part, I would report to you, of almost any complex investigation. Well, l let me ask you this. Has any of your agents indicated that they felt their ability to investigate has been impeded by the task force or anybody at the Justice Department? Uh, not impeded in the sense that they were unable to uh, conduct what we believe is the requisite investigation. There have been complaints uh, and there have been differences uh, between uh, prosecutors and agents in this case. Uh, again, not an uncommon phenomenon about the, uh, the scope or the direction or the perspective, uh, but those have been to my satisfaction uh, well, resolved without the investigation being harmed or impeded. Well, you said not in that sense. In what sense were there some uh, suggestions that they were impeded or being frustrated. I mean, wh what, what, what did they say? What were their complaints? We discuss uh, regularly the, uh, uh, the pace with which uh, grand jury materials are returned, uh, the pace with which uh, witnesses are interviewed, the pace with which uh, parts of the investigation are moving uh, forward. Uh, so, as I said to you, there have been issues uh, in that regard. There have also been issues where the prosecutors have said, we've not been uh, moving uh, quick enough or fast enough, and I've taken those with consideration, uh, in some cases uh, appropriately uh, criticizing us, and I've taken steps to compensate for that on our side. Well, th this next question bears upon the frustration level of some of your agents. How many of the FBI agents assigned to the task force have requested reassignment or been reassigned since the Justice Department task force investigation began? I don't know personally of any uh, any FBI personnel who have requested reassignment because of uh, frustration or concerns about the conduct of the investigation. We have about 93 people there, agents and support. Uh, I will check for you, but I don't know about well, could you let anyone it... who's asked for a reassignment for those reasons. Well, there have been some that have been reassigned, I understand. And, and we've, we've had a lot of people there on a temporary basis. We've moved people in and out because of the numbers required. Uh, and I will check after the hearing today, but I don't, I don't know of any instance where someone is asked to be reassigned because they were frustrated with the course of the investigation. In your opening statement, you complimented the investigators and lawyers of this committee in terms of the handling of classified material. Is it your intention to have FBI agents make efforts to see information compiled by this committee? Um, I think that's an area that uh, we've spoke about with Mr. Bennett. It would be helpful to our investigation. We would certainly uh, abide by whatever parameters were appropriate, but uh, yes, it would be very helpful. Well, we'd, we'd like to invite you to uh, coordinate efforts uh, by your investigative staff with ours to try to facilitate that because we may have some information that might be helpful to you. Thank you. What kind of uh, permission do, do, do FBI agents have to get from the Justice Department to interview senior White House staff? What kind of clearance do they have to have? Do they have to go to the, uh, to the uh, uh, Justice Department or the task force to get uh, approval or authorization to interview people at the White House? In the, in the course of this investigation, um, we have arranged those types of interviews uh, generally by noticing the, uh, the people involved or the office involved. Uh, in, in some instances, in several occasions, uh, we, have, uh, we have not done so, depending on the circumstances of the interview and the uh, the menu where we think it should be well, conducted. In, in most cases, do you have to clear with the uh, task force or the Justice Department or someone over there, do you have to clear uh, in most cases or uh, whether or not uh, an FBI agent goes in and talks to somebody? In most cases, uh, before we would interview a very high-ranking uh, member of uh, the administration, for instance, we would, of course, uh, uh, tell the uh, assistant U.S. attorney, the prosecutors, that was being done. They would probably make a contact or a liaison with the person, or if they had a lawyer, with the lawyer. Uh, many individuals are now represented by counsel, and of course we can't uh, go and interview someone if we know they have counsel, so in some cases we would speak to Would the gentleman first. yield? Just one second. Let me ask one more question. Just wanted to <laughs> yield on that one well, question. I know, but let me just finish. Have they turned you down? on any people that you wanted to have FBI agents investigate or talk to? No. 
They not that not. I'm not that I'm aware of. Mr. Gilman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for permitting me to intervene. The Attorney General earlier today said only if they're covered, and they're covered if they're, the inspector, uh, the uh, uh, if an independent counsel regime has been triggered. So I'm asking you: Are there times when you want to interrogate someone, and they're not covered because there has been no independent counsel regime uh, that's been triggered? Does that prevent you from, at any time? interrogating no. potential witness. No, it doesn't, Mr. Gilman. Mr. The, the chairman asked me whether, when we wanted to interview somebody, uh, he didn't say whether as a subject or a witness, but in any case, uh, whether we would uh, notify anybody in the White House or uh, the Justice Department. And again, if the person had counsel, we would have to speak to their attorney. Uh, no, no, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking if, you, if there is a potential uh, witness that you want to interrogate, forget whether he's in the White House or not in the White House, and they're not covered because there's no independent counsel that's been triggered. Are you then prevented from interrogating that potential witness? No, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. When the FBI investigators want to request documents from the White House, what procedure has to be followed? We, uh, we draw up a subpoena and we uh, serve the subpoena. The subpoena has to be approved by the prosecutor. It's a so it has to go through the task force or the prosecutor? Yeah, we can't issue subpoenas on our own. Okay. Has the White House certified to the task force that it has completed its production? Uh, I think there is probably, as we speak, outstanding production. I would have to check on that. We, we've gotten <laughs> uh, many records, uh, whether we've gotten all of them on the dates that they were requested and whether or not there have been extensions. Uh, I'd have to do some research well, for you. Well, if you've got them and we haven't, I'd like to know about it because we started, we sent a subpoena in March and they said we had everything in June and yesterday we got more and we just keep getting more and more and more and they keep telling us we have everything. So if, uh, if you have, uh, if they've concluded everything for you, I'd like to know about it. Has the White House continued to produce documents? Are they still giving you documents? Yes, sir, they are. And uh, have delays in the White House's production of documents hampered the task force investigation in any way? Because we've, we've had problems with those delays. We would have liked to have gotten them uh, quicker. There uh, have been many delays with respect to uh, production, and we have uh, uh, pursued the uh, enforcement and the return of those uh, subpoenas whenever we thought they were getting uh, beyond the time requirements. But uh, any time we don't get records as quick as we would like them, it slows things down. Uh, are you, then I presume you're not confident that you have all the documents yet. I am not confident that we have all the documents yet. Many of the documents produced by the DNC to this committee have been directly related to senior administration officials, including the president and the vice president. Do you have all the documents from the DNC, Democrat National Committee? Again, we've issued several subpoenas. Whether we've gotten production on all of them, I, I can find out for you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to know that if you can give it, for, give it to us. Has the DNC given the task force a date certain for the completion of its production? Again, I'll, I'll check for you. I'm not sure. There, there's, a, there's ongoing subpoenas. Uh, different events trigger new subpoenas and uh, amended subpoenas. So I can get you a, an accurate reporting of that, but I don't know. Well, have you given the DNC a deadline for production? Every subpoena has a deadline. And I, I, what we try to do is enforce that uh, deadline. And if there are things that are withheld, uh, we want to know why. If there are privileges that are asserted, we want those privileges to be asserted uh, in an official manner. Um, so there's always a, a deadline and then sometimes extended deadlines that we're working on. How, how late are they on their deadline right now on the deadlines that you provided? I'd have to go back and, and crosswalk all the subpoenas with the uh, returns and... Well, can you give that to us uh, when you get a chance? Uh, I can check for you overnight. Has the DNC asserted any privileges? Um, not that I'm aware of at this point. Could you check that for us as well? Yesterday, the Los Angeles Times printed an article discussing the case of money laundering involved Charlie Tree and his associate Macau Ninglap Singh, better known as Mr. Wu. This article was a continuation of the matter initially presented before this committee in October when his sister Manlin Fong testified. Uh, are you familiar with that article? Yes, sir. Are those people being investigated, the ones that uh, were in that article? Um, again, uh, for me to publicly say who we're investigating uh, for what, or to confirm that article, wouldn't be, wouldn't be 
following my obligations as director? Well, I, I don't believe that your agency is. Our, I think our staff, uh, and a gentleman who was with Senator Thompson's staff previously now works for us, I believe he's the one that uh, found that information or was a, a part of gathering that information. So uh, I hope that you'll pursue that as quickly as possible. I see my time's expired, but I w uh, there was $200,000 that came in from Macau, from Ning Lap Singh to Charlie Tree. We now know that 80000 was laundered. Uh, we hope that you'll pursue that Delgin. Mr. Lanto. And we'd like to enter that uh, this information into the record without objection. Mr. Lanto. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome our distinguished director of the FBI. And before I begin my questioning, Mr. Chairman, I want to deal with your frustration phobia because you sort of probed the director on numerous occasions about how frustrated his people are. Uh, I don't think any of his people were as frustrated as your chief counsel in submitting a resignation to you. Your chief investigators haven't yet resigned, have they, Mr. Director? No, no, sir. No. Well, let me read then, for the record, a letter dated July 1, 1997, to the Honorable Dan Burton, Chairman, from John Rowley III, who was the chief counsel of this committee on the Republican side, I might add. Dear Mr. Chairman, it is with sincere regret that I submit my resignation as chief counsel to the committee effective immediately. Six months ago, I joined the committee with the intention of running a professional credible investigation. With your encouragement, I immediately set out to bring on the career prosecutors, law enforcement agents, and other personnel required to make that happen. However, it is now apparent that I have not been given the authority necessary to accomplish the committee's goals. Due to the unrelenting self-promoting actions of the committee's investigative coordinator, I have been unable to implement the standards of professional conduct I have been accustomed to at the United States Attorney's Office. So I think in terms of frustration, uh, the prize has already been taken by uh, the former chief counsel to, uh, to the majority, and I think it's important to, uh, to let the record show that frustrations are not unique to the cooperative efforts between the Justice Department and the FBI. Uh, Mr. Director, I just want to state for the record, and I hope I'm not embarrassing you, because you have heard this before, I have the highest regard for both your professional competence and your integrity. You have served our nation with exemplary distinction, and uh, while everybody is aware of many of your activities, I am particularly conscious of the enormously helpful international activities you have been involved with in terms of fighting drugs, international terrorism, money laundering, and others. And, uh, and we are honored to have you, you appear before us, as we were honored to have uh, Janet Reno a few hours ago. I want to begin by the chairman's opening comment um, to the Attorney General and his reference to you about this division of views between Attorneys General and FBI Directors. Um, am I correct in my recollection of recent American history that practically all Attorneys General and FBI directors in recent decades have had occasional disagreements. I think that's fair to say, sir. So, it, so far from this being unique, it has been the standard accepted notion that intelligent, committed, serious, dedicated people on occasion disagree. Would you agree with that statement? I think it's a healthy thing in many respects. I fully agree with you. I fully agree with you, Mr. Director. Um, you have now worked with uh, the Attorney General for four years plus. Did you know her before? No, sir, I did not. 
I'd like you to describe for us in your own words your judgment of her as a professional and as a person. As I said in my opening statement, uh, I have the highest regard for her as a lawyer. I think her integrity is impeccable. I've seen her bring uh, good judgment to difficult decisions. I've seen uh, compassion in all of her decisions, uh, particularly where uh, the lives or the safety of uh, victims or law enforcement officers are concerned. Um, it's been a, uh, a pleasure uh, dealing with her. One of the reasons I took this job, and I was not eager to take it, I didn't seek it, was the uh, meeting I had with Janet Reno in April of 1993. I was very impressed by her at that time and continue to be. Uh, we, have a, we have a great relationship professionally, uh, personally, and um, uh, despite what, uh, what some may uh, say or seek to say about that element of our relationship, uh, believe me, this decision has not affected that one way or the other. I think we have great respect for each other. We differ from time to time. This is not the first time in four and a quarter years, probably won't be the last. Uh, Mr. Director, the Attorney General sought your opinion on many issues, am I correct? Yes, sir. Do you feel that when the Attorney General seeks your opinion, is it a genuine seeking of your opinion or is she just going through a pro forma set of motions so that she will have uh, the input of the Director of the FBI? No, it's my understanding and my belief that uh, she sincerely seeks those opinions. I don't think she's just doing it for pro forma reasons. And if I thought she was, I wouldn't give her my opinions. Have you at any time felt that she was dismissive of your opinions? No, quite the contrary. Do you have the slightest doubt of Ms. Reno's integrity? No, sir. Do you have the slightest doubt of Ms. Reno's honesty? Absolutely not. Do you have the slightest doubt that Ms. Reno attempts to do her job as Attorney General in full accordance with the oath of office she took? I think she meets that standard and exceeds it. Now, you obviously had a different opinion with respect to the issue we are discussing. Might your judgment be wrong? It might be. Um, it's not unreasonable for us to expect intelligent, committed, serious people occasionally to reach differing conclusions. No, particularly lawyers. Particularly lawyers. Um, let me deal for a moment with your relationship and history with the President of the United States. Have you known the President for a long time? I met him uh, the first time when uh, he interviewed me for this position, and uh, that was the first meeting. How would you characterize your relationship with the President? I report uh, to the President through the Attorney General. I'm accountable to him. Uh, he hired me. Uh, he can fire me. Has the President at any time attempted to influence your judgments or decisions or advice to the Attorney General on this matter? No, sir. Has the Vice President at any time done so? No, sir. Would you describe your relationship with both of these gentlemen as correct and professional? Yes, it is not personal. It is uh, purely professional in the capacity that they hold in their offices and the capacity that I hold in my office. Now, Mr. Burton attempted to make a point, not very successfully, I might add, that the letter you and uh, the Attorney General jointly sent to Mr. Burton was basically a Burton was basically a, a Reno letter and you just affixed your signature. Is that an accurate characterization of what happened? It's clearly accurate that I didn't draft the letter. I don't think Ms. Reno drafted it either. Uh, our counsel on both sides worked on it uh, for quite a few hours yesterday. I read it carefully. I wouldn't have signed it or permitted my name to be on there if I didn't agree with it. Well, we are living in an age when most of the letters we sign are drafted by others. 
Is that? Uh, that's true. That's true. All right. So is it true, therefore, that if your council was consulted, had the opportunity to modify, reject, revise uh, the original draft, uh, that would have taken place prior to you refixing your name to it? Yeah, it was actually more than that. They faxed me the letter. Uh, um, I had to get the second page because my five-year-old destroyed the first one. But uh, I actually saw it and read it. That's an improvement over the dog ate my homework. Uh, but it's, I did get uh, it's it close. retransmitted. It's close. Yeah. Um, therefore, the letter the Attorney General and you jointly signed and sent to Mr. Burton on December 8th fully reflects your views. Yes, sir. I agree with it. Now, if it does, then you would conclude with me that requesting your memorandum, which was offered in privacy, knowing full well that the Attorney General was calling on you for your valued advice, as she was calling on others, this letter of Mr. Burton requesting your memo and subpoenaing the memo, you must consider an inappropriate request. Well, I would never say that the, um, the exercise of a congressional function, particularly pursuant to your subpoena authority, is an improper request. What I think uh, needs to happen is everybody has to look at the uh, implications of that request. It's not improper for you to exercise your uh, lawful authority to subpoena a document. Neither is it improper for myself and the Attorney General to, uh, instead of immediately complying, uh, do two things. One, point out the really severe implications that uh, would result, in my view, if this was very easily turned over. And secondly, to see if we can, as I mentioned, sit down and discuss how we can preserve your uh, prerogative, which is uh, constitutionally critical, and our prerogative to protect uh, not only information, but a confidential relationship. You know, you may have a director someday, not me, as I said, who, uh, when asked for his opinion, may say, well, you know, maybe I'm not going to put this in a memo. Maybe I'm just going to informally, uh, in the hallway, tell the Attorney General what I think. I think that's bad for the system, and I think we ought to think carefully about what we're doing. Mr. Burton pressed you on the question of a conflict between your FBI investigators and the attorneys in the Department of Justice. Is it not almost routine for investigators and attorneys to have some professional conflict because they approach the problem from differing vantage points? I, I think that's fair. You know, when I, when I was a 25-year-old FBI agent in New York, uh, I used to, on a daily basis, fight with the very fine assistant U.S. attorneys in an office I later became the deputy U.S. attorney because we didn't think they were moving quick enough, we didn't think they were being uh, effective, we didn't agree with their strategy. It's really a natural part of an investigation. I would hate to see an investigation where that didn't occur because somebody would not be doing their job. I could not agree with you more. So an attempt to portray an almost built intention in fact reflects a routine phenomenon in almost all investigative agency and attorney relationships. I think it's fair to say that that friction is inherent in the two separate roles that they have. What they have to do is at the end of the day make sure they've fully and fairly looked at everything, but you know the prosecutor makes the charging decisions with the grand jury and many times an agent will think, well, this person should have been charged or they should not have been charged, but we shouldn't be making those decisions, and I don't think you want an FBI making those kind of decisions. I, I fully agree with you, Director Free. Now, Senator Hatch proposed to you that you conduct your own investigation. You did receive that letter. Yes, I did. May I ask you what your view is of that suggestion? Um, I'd like to sit down with Senator Hatch and discuss it with him. I've not had the opportunity to do that. I haven't looked at the legislative history of the statute, I'm told, and I don't know this for a fact because I haven't read it myself, but I'm told the legislative history had to do with making it clear that the Department of Justice could investigate the Department of the Treasury, and that was the intent behind the statute. I don't know that personally. I'm going to research it, talk to Senator Hatch, and I'll certainly consider his letter as I, as I always do.
Are you gearing up for a separate investigation as we speak? Well, no, we, we have an investigation. Yeah. It's in the task But not a separate one. Uh, at this point, no, I don't. Do you have the slightest doubt, Mr. Director, of Attorney General Reno's ability to enforce the laws fairly and objectively? No, sir. I believe she intends to do that. Uh, and as I said, that's been reflected in all of my dealings with her. Now my next question is a bit nebulous, but I know you will understand what I mean and will answer very accurately. Sometimes we feel passionately about a position we take. Sometimes we take a position, but we see powerful reasons on the other side, and it's really a close call. When you made your recommendation to have an independent counsel. On a scale of 10, was it a 10 judgment on your part, or was it a 4 or 5 or 6 judgment? It, that is a nebulous question. Um, well, try to give a non-nebulous answer. If I didn't believe very strongly in the recommendation, I would not have made it. I, I made it because I believed it was right. When the Attorney General declined to appoint an independent counsel, um, did the ongoing investigation come to a grinding halt? No, sir. Did not impede it at all. It is proceeding with full force? Yes, it is. Do you have all the necessary resources to conduct the investigation? I believe that we do. We're constantly looking at uh, uh, equipment, resources, space. Uh, if I decide, as I might in the next couple of weeks, that I need to add more assistants or more uh, uh, special agents, I'll certainly make that decision. Has the Attorney General in any way, directly or indirectly, impeded your ability to devote the resources you deem necessary to the investigation? No. She has given you full support. Yes, sir, she has. Let me spend a moment on the leaks. On December 2, Mr. Burton's favorite paper, the New York Times, reported extensively <laughs> on your memorandum. <clears throat> the story noted that the source was a, quote, law enforcement official who described the memo to the reporter. Um, Have you begun an internal inquiry as to the source of that leak? We have had since uh, October 6th an inquiry with respect to a story uh, in the Washington Post which detailed, in our view, many of the uh, inner discussions, including grand jury discussions about this case. The references in the press to the existence of this memo and a summary of its contents uh, is now, at my direction, rolled into uh, that inquiry. Uh, let me just say that uh, I do uh, deplore uh, any leaks with respect to that. I, I handled this memorandum in terms of its preparation, uh, delivery, and distribution in the uh, most careful manner that I could conceive to prevent uh, the reports that have occurred. I don't believe, based on press accounts and what reporters have said, that anybody has a copy of the memo. They are speculating as to what's in there. Uh, the reason I don't believe they have a copy of it is because I wrote it, and many of the things which I think would normally be reported uh, have not been reported. So I don't believe anybody has a copy of the memo, and that's what I intended. Mr. Director, congressional investigations sometimes have a way of putting a spoke in the wheel of criminal investigations. Would it damage your case if the material in your memorandum to the Attorney General would be revealed as Mr. Burton requested? I believe it would damage the inquiry, and more importantly, I believe it would damage the process. Uh, you know, I, wrote, I write a lot of memorandums to a lot of people discussing uh, who should be investigated for what, uh, based on what evidence. And it doesn't seem to me that you could distinguish between this memo, except for the great interest of the matter, uh, 
against any other case where we decide that a local uh, drug distributor uh, should be prosecuted or shouldn't be, and maybe the assistant U.S. attorney disagrees and we write a memo. In other words, if we're going to cross that bridge, we should do it with the knowledge that we would be opening up, in my view, uh, a Pandora's box. Nobody wants to have uh, FBI agents and prosecutors either publicly debating or publicly uh, answering in a forum like this uh, those types of issues. Uh, I think the due process requirements of the Constitution and decency uh, should really prevent that. I couldn't agree with you more. To the best of your knowledge, has the FBI ever turned over decisional material in an open criminal case? Uh, it, I guess it depends what you mean uh, by decisional material. Uh, I don't know in my own experience, 23 years, uh, including uh, a couple years on the bench, of an instance where we would, uh, the Department of Justice would turn over um, a memo on an active criminal investigation that talks about who, what, when, and where. I don't know of any such instance. So you fully agree with our distinguished Attorney General that the memo must not be released? That's my belief, sir. When you wrote the memorandum, Mr. Director, did you intend it to be kept confidential? Yes, which is, which is exactly why I gave only one copy to the Attorney General and one copy to the Deputy Attorney General, and only four other copies existed. Are you aware of the fact that this committee has been plagued by leaks? Um, I know that that's been expressed uh, publicly, yes, sir. Um, Would the gentleman yield? Not at this point. Um, is it your considered judgment, Mr. Director, that the ongoing investigation, should it lead to findings which in the view of the Attorney General would in fact call for the appointment of an independent counsel, she would not hesitate to call for one? I, I take her at her word that if she found the uh, triggering requirements, she would do so. Yes, sir. Um, let me thank you for your usual professional and candid statements. Gentlemen, you and uh, and let me uh, let me indicate to you that uh, certainly I and I believe all of my colleagues on this side have full confidence in your integrity and ability to conduct this investigation. And with, with I the, yield. With the, with the gentleman yield, I'll give him an extra minute. But I'd I'd like to uh, respond to one of your comments if you yield to me briefly. As a matter of courtesy, I shall yield to you. Thank you very much. Let me just say that the. Uh, FBI director just complimented uh, uh, our legal staff and our office on the way we've uh, kept confidential material, classified material confidential. And uh, uh, although there have been some allegations of leaks by our committee, I know of none uh, that has taken place since the very, very beginning. And the person who uh, did uh, give that information out was chastised since that time. There has been no leaks that I know of, and if the gentleman from California has information uh, contrary to that, I certainly wish he'd give it to me. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, I am very pleased to, to have yielded to my friend, and i equally pleased to respond to his request. I want to refer Mr. Burton to a letter uh, dated June 4, 1997, by our ranking member, Mr. Waxman. Um, which reads as follows. I want to bring to your personal attention several potentially serious matters regarding the conduct of the majority staff in the committee's campaign finance investigation and to request your immediate investigation of these matters. First, it has come to my attention that members of your staff interviewed a witness, Mr. Soberano, in your offices on Tuesday, May 13th. Mr. Soberano's name first appeared in the press on February 20, when the Washington Post reported that he declined John Wong's request that he make campaign contributions of questionable legality. Mr. Robert Soberano has told my staff that when he was interviewed by your staff, 
He wanted the minority staff to attend because he felt that both Republicans and Democrats should have access to his testimony. For this reason, he asked your staff whether a member of the minority staff would attend the interview. According to Mr. Soberano, your staff told him that the minority staff was invited but declined to attend the interview. In fact, the minority never declined to attend the interview because we were not invited to Mr. Soberano's interview. Second, I understand that two of your senior staff took a trip to Miami on February 21 to interview witnesses, again without notice to the minority. On this trip, your staff interviewed at least two witnesses, Vivian Mamerud, a businesswoman and occasional Democratic fundraiser, and Jorge Cabrera, a convicted drug smuggler who is incarcerated in a federal penitentiary. In the case of Ms. Manarud, I have been told that your staff showed up at her place of business unannounced, without a prior appointment, and in full view of her customers, leading her to believe that she had to submit to an immediate interview. Although Ms. Manarud is represented by counsel, I have been told that she was not advised that she could contact her attorney. Your staff did, however, apparently assure Ms. Manarud that anything she would she said would be used only for the purpose of the committee's official investigation. Contrary to your staff representation that the interview would be used only for official committee business, it appears that your staff may have given information from the interviews with Ms. Manarud and Ms. Cabrera to the media. The New York Times published a front page story on April 4 about a contribution that Ms. Manarud allegedly solicited from Mr. Cabrera. The New York Times article relies on information, quote, congressional investigators have learned, end quote, attributes crucial facts to, quote, the investigators who spoke on condition of anonymity, end quote, and states that the new details about the location for the solicitation of Cabrera's contribution and the source of the money have come to light in congressional in investigators' interviews here with Cabrera. Both Ms. Manarud and Mr. Cabrera have told my staff that the only congressional investigators they spoke with prior to the April 4 article in the New York Times were the investigators from your staff. Information from these interviews may also have been given to CNN. On April 4, CNN's Inside Politics program reported, quote, the Burton Committee is looking at Jorge Cabrera. House GOP investigators say some of the $20,000 was drug money and that it was solicited in Havana, end quote. These incidents warrant your thorough investigation. If in fact your staff made false or misleading statements to Mr. Soberano of Ms. Manarud, that would obviously be improper. If in fact information was given to the press that would appear to conflict with your assurances that your staff would not engage in such conduct. As I recall, the first time a leak from the Government Reform Committee was reported in the press, quote, Burton admits aid leaked Wong records, roll call November 25, 1996. You stated, I quote, I do not allow my staff to release any information without my approval, and I do not expect this to happen again. End quote. I've also learned this week that you plan, again without having given any notice to the minority, to send two members of your staff to Hong Kong and Taiwan, and perhaps other foreign countries, to conduct witness interviews from June 9 to June 20. I strongly oppose your plan to conduct secret witness interviews in foreign countries. In my experience, there is simply no precedent for this conduct. I urge you to reconsider your decision and include the minority in this trip. In my view, these incidents highlight the unfairness of your policy of excluding minority staff from witness interviews. Your policy denies the minority access to information you and your staff acquire, and, there is, and as a result prevents the minority from ever knowing the full facts. It forces the minority staff to try to schedule its own interviews, which is nearly impossible since the minority does not even know whom the majority staff is interviewing. And as the case of Mr. Soberano and Ms. Manarud appears to demonstrate, 
it is fundamentally unfair to witnesses who may be misled or fail to fully understand representations made by your staff or who have to spend additional time and incur additional lawyer's fees having separate interviews with the minority. Prior investigations have followed a more bipartisan approach and included the minority in witness interviews. In the last Congress, as you know, you were on the select subcommittee of the United States role in Iranian arms transfers to Croatia and Bosnia. In that investigation, Chairman Hyde specifically provided that all witness interviews be jointly conducted with majority and minority staff. Well, you ask that I provide evidence, and I'm attempting to do that. I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, sir. Similar policies were followed in many other investigations. For example, in the House Watergate investigation, witness interviews were conducted by a nonpartisan staff that reported to both the majority and minority counsel. In the Iran Contra investigation, the majority notified the minority of witness interviews and provided the minority with an opportunity to participate. And in the Senate Whitewater investigation, unilateral witness interviews were prohibited by agreement of the majority and the minority. Your counterpart in the Senate, Senator Thompson, has agreed to conduct witness interviews jointly with the minority during the Senate campaign finance investigation. I will not read the rest of this letter, and I will not read another letter by our ranking member dated September uh, <clears throat> 4, in which he again expresses concern over unauthorized release of documents obtained during the course of the investigation. There have been leaks from this committee, and we are urging you to put an end to those leaks. You, you, you uh, uh, gave me additional, uh, gave me a, uh, yielded to me, so I'm going to give you uh, uh, five more minutes because. Would, uh, would the gentleman yield? But, but before I do that, let me just say this. <coughs> I have read those letters, they're six months old. We checked them out. There was no credibility to them. Those are accusations made by the minority. And I can't, if you can give me documented evidence of leaks, I'll certainly accede to your wishes and it will remove people from the staff if we know that that happened. But letters with just innuendo simply aren't going to cut it. Now you have five additional minutes. Would well, I merely would like to say that um, the September 4 letter from our colleague, the ranking uh, minority member, was never responded to by you, Mr. Chairman. So it's unfair to characterize our colleague's letter as innuendo when you didn't dignify it with a written response. Would the gentleman yield? I'll be happy to yield. Thank you. Uh, Director Free, let me first uh, thank you for your patience. You've been here all day. And obviously, uh, you're doing a wonderful job at the FBI because if you can spend your whole day with us, uh, rather than chasing uh, drug traffickers or murderers or uh, people who are engaged in other types of criminal activity in our country. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to minimize this issue. This is probably an important issue, but not structured as we have went about it today. You responded to a number of questions from the chairman, uh, which went to, to some degree, uh, the relationship of the investigation. I want to clarify something. The FBI and the task force that you are participating in is not an investigation of democratic financial campaign abuses. It's in regards to any illegalities related to finance, financing of elections in the previous uh, federal elections. Is that correct? Uh, that's a fair characteristic. And it was the FBI, along with the Justice Department, that produced the investigation that led to the conviction. Um, six million dollar fine and house arrest of the vice chair of the Dole campaign. Is that correct? In Massachusetts? The gentleman from Aqua Leisure, Mr. Fireson? Well, it was, it was, you're asking whether that was a Department of Justice investigation? Yes. Yeah, was. Okay, in the investigation of the company from Pennsylvania, my home state, that was just fine, a multi-million dollar fine and um, was involved in conduit payments of hundreds of thousands of dollars into the Dole campaign was also an investigation of the Department of Justice. Yes, sir. So even though the chairman questioned you about whether or not, you know, you had subpoenaed documents from the White House or subpoenaed documents from the DNC, 
his questioning may have led others to assume that somehow all of the angels were Republicans and all of those who were involved in wrongdoing were Democrats. Your investigation, you're looking for wrongdoing anywhere. Yeah, I, did, I certainly didn't take his questions to mean that. We are looking well, let for me ask you anybody, to, excuse yeah. me, who's committed any kind of uh, violation of law and we'll, we'll let, look let at me, it vigorously. Let me paraphrase his question and change them slightly. He asked you, had you received all of the documents that you had subpoenaed from the DNC? And you answered that question. Have you subpoenaed documents from the RNC? Well, I don't think I should uh, get into I agree discussions with you. about what I, we've subpoenaed or not subpoenaed. To you is, I, since I do agree with you, yes. Mr. Director, is I wonder why you answered the chairman's question in that regard, because you seem to be going well beyond what normally would have been your response, which was the response you just gave me. Well, I think he was comparing uh, that situation to the uh, committee's uh, subpoenas, and we were discussing the, that yeah. as a Well, the committee's in a different in a different mode. You might have noticed that this committee and all of the editorials from the newspapers that the chairman was quoting earlier have uh, talked about this committee's partisan leaning investigation. So I just want to separate the activities of the committee from the activities of an agency like the FBI, which has a very fine reputation. And I know with a certainty uh, that there are matters of impropriety and questions that need to be resolved having to do with both parties and both uh, campaigns for the presidency in the last election and as it relates to congressional elections in both 1996 and 94. Uh, and I just want to give you an opportunity to put on the record the fact that Americans everywhere, Democrats and Republicans and ind independents, uh, none should sleep well tonight, that all matters are going to be investigated. Task Force, uh, absolutely correctly, is looking at everything. We don't distinguish. If, if I may reclaim my time for a moment, I just would like to conclude on the question of leaks, uh, Mr. Burton, that in a letter Did the they director written, a chance to finish his answer? Uh, I, my time is running out. That's why. Um, on November 26, 1997, our ranking member wrote a letter to you on another subject. And the concluding paragraph refers to the earlier letter, and I quote, I would like to remind you that you have yet to respond to my letter of September 4, asking you to investigate the facts underlying deposition testimony, indicating that your staff leaked confidential committee records about this issue to the press. So we really can't deal very effectively if a September letter is never responded to and the November letter today, December 9, has not yet been responded to. Please go ahead and finish your answer. Yeah, we, we have a, a, a totally nonpartisan investigation. We don't distinguish along uh, party lines or personality lines or whether it's an a, a office holder or not an office holder. Everything is open to inquiry. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Cox. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome again. Director Free, uh, because of your current position and because of your past experience as a federal judge, as a prosecutor, as a lawyer, uh, and because you stated in your testimony that your disagreement with the Attorney General was about a matter of law, uh, I'd like to ask you about the independent counsel statute. Uh, the uh, independent counsel statute is written in such fashion that after a preliminary investigation takes place, there either is or isn't an application to the three-judge panel for the appointment of an independent counsel. And the statute, section 592C, makes an independent counsel, or at least an application for an independent counsel, mandatory for the attorney general if, quote, there are reasonable grounds to believe further investigation is warranted. And uh, uh, that may or may not be a right copy of this. Have you got uh, the law in front of you, 592C? If not, I'll yes. give your counsel. Yeah, I believe I do. And uh, you're familiar with the independent counsel statute, of course. Yes. Uh, is that your understanding of Section 592C? Yes, that further investigation is warranted and so that the other requisites have been met. So if there are reasonable grounds in the language of the statute, if there are reasonable grounds to believe that further investigation is warranted, then there must be an application for an independent counsel. Is that right? Under C, if it's a covered person. Yes, sir. That's right. Now, the vice president's a covered person, right? Yes, he is. 
and the Attorney General limited her preliminary investigation to those phone calls in his case. Is that correct? Yes, that was the way she defined right. the she, preliminary investigation. She defined investigation. it that narrowly, although the New York Times referred to it as using a matador's cape, the phone calls being a matador's cape to distract attention from the other more major matters involved here. That was the New York Times editorial view. But she defined it that way. The vice president is a covered person and the matter being investigated was the phone calls. She conducted a preliminary investigation under the statute and then she decided not to make application to the three judge panel, which means under the statute that there are not reasonable grounds to believe further investigation is warranted. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, so I take it you're not investigating it. Well, if you look at the filing to the court, as we discussed a moment ago, the filing to the court had to do with those facts and events, but not in a vacuum, those facts and events in relation to uh, Section 607. So I think it's a more limited inquiry than the one you've just stated. But if there were reasonable grounds to investigate it, which I take it is a predicate for the FBI even now investigating it, then there would have to be an application to the three-judge panel for an independent counsel. I'm correct on the law, am I not? Reasonable grounds to investigate in specific uh, furtherance or in specific support of a violation of 607. I, I think you have to put that qualifier in. Well, I, I ask this because the Attorney General testified under oath before the House Judiciary Committee on October 15th that she wouldn't discontinue any investigation unless Director Free and I jointly approve that decision. We will not close the matter again, I reiterate, unless Director Free and I sign off on it. She has, of course, uh, uh, closed it off on the Vice President. Uh, she did not decide to make an independent counsel, and you, of course, did not sign off on it. Isn't that correct? You know, rather than talking about a specific aspect of the recommendation, again, I would respectfully say that I, uh, I recommended a independent counsel, but I really don't want to go into the specific bases and give you uh, a legal analysis, either as a director or a former judge, on a statute that is not a statute that I'm entitled to invoke in the facts that you're giving me. Uh, I understand the reasons that you have advanced for not wishing to provide this committee uh, with the memorandum that you wrote to the Attorney General recommending an independent counsel in this case and stating your reasons for disagreeing with her position. Uh, but we read the newspapers and the front page of the Wall Street Journal last Friday in the Washington Wire had this to say, the FBI director's still secret memo advocating an outside prosecutor claims the Democrats' diversion of party building funds into campaign accounts may have constituted a conspiracy reaching into the White House. Among other possible crimes, he cited misusing government resources and obstructing justice. Are you aware of any instance in which a sitting Attorney General has disagreed in writing with a sitting FBI director about a possible conspiracy reaching into the White House? <laughs> it's a very carefully framed question. I do not know from my own experience of a dispute, legal dispute, or disagreement between a attorney general and FBI agent with respect to an independent counsel matter. Uh, that doesn't mean that there haven't in the past been such things, and I'm just not aware of them. But to your knowledge, this is the first time it's ever happened. Certainly the first time that I'm aware of it. Uh, my time has expired. I thank you. Yeah. The time has expired, uh, Mr. Sanders. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I was glad to hear you earlier state that, state that the purpose of this hearing is not to drive a wedge between you, between Mr. Free and the Attorney General. Some would have thought otherwise, but I'm glad to hear that that is not the case. Uh, Mr. Free, in the course of your work, is it unusual for serious people to have differences of opinion about important issues? No, sir. I mean, should it be something that the members of this committee should be shocked at that you and the Attorney General might disagree about the wisdom or the appropriateness of having an independent counsel? Is that something that we should really be terribly shocked at? 
I, I can't speak for the members of the committee. But in your course of doing business, serious people having serious disagreements is not unusual. Is that correct? In the course of my work, there are frequent uh, matters of consensus. There are also not infrequent matters of disagreement by very serious principled people for good reasons. And I gather from your discussion with Ms. Stellantis that you think that this clash of ideas and honest differences of opinion is a good way to do business and that you do not want to see a climate created where there is not that clash of ideas. No, exactly. The assistant directors that I have, uh, I expect them that they will come to me as they frequently do and disagree with me, voice different opinions. Uh, if they didn't do that, in my view, they wouldn't be doing their job. Uh, in the letter that uh, you and Janet Reno uh, signed uh, dated December 8th. Let me read the next to last paragraph. It says, and I quote, finally, the department has reviewed the precedents cited in your letter and in the accompanying Congressional Research Service memorandum. It is unprecedented for a congressional committee to demand internal decision-making memoranda generated during an ongoing criminal investigation. None of the cited examples are to the contrary. In particular, the three prior matters that you highlighted, you being Mr. Burton, in your letter did not involve ongoing criminal investigations and therefore are not relevant precedents. Would you like to comment on that? No more than to say that I think the, the facts of this case and the context of an ongoing criminal investigation uh, is different from the cases cited in the letter. Okay. Um, Mr. Free, I gather you are learning more about campaign financing than you ever had hoped to learn about. Uh, what do you think about a system in which individuals can contribute on huge sums of money to political parties? Does that make sense to you? You know, I really don't have an opinion and I don't think the FBI director should have an opinion on that. Okay. Does such a system make law enforcement somewhat difficult? We enforce the laws that we have. Uh, if, they're, uh, if they're very clear and they have good uh, case law and legislative history, it makes it easier. We enforce what we have or we don't enforce it. Let me um, quote from your statement today, and I quote you, I have stated many times my respect for Attorney General Reno. In the four and a quarter years we have worked together, I have seen her bring nothing but integrity and honesty to the table. What I am hearing is that despite the fact, end of quote, what I'm hearing is that despite the fact there may be a difference of opinion with her on this issue, you have enjoyed working with her, you respect her, and look forward to continue to working with her. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that there has been an attempt today, which I frankly do not think is successful, has been successful, in trying to take two dedicated public servants who disagree on an issue and suggest that the difference is in fact deeper than it is. Honest people within the Republican Party, within the Democratic Party, within the progressive community disagree on issues. And uh, I would just conclude or yield my time to anyone who may want it, uh, conclude by applauding uh, you for the work that you are doing, uh, applauding uh, Attorney General Reno for the work that she is doing and look forward to the two of you continuing uh, to work together as well as you have. The gentleman yield. I would yield to uh, Mr. Barrett. Thank you. And I, first of all, I want to uh, compliment you for your patience being here today. Uh, you've obviously been very concerned about this. I also want to say that I often cite you as a role model um, for your career, but more importantly, as a, a mature father of young children. It's something that I appreciate very much, although I can't understand how you get up in the morning and run uh, with those little kids at home. So it's something I'm trying to figure out how to do. Um, Attorney General said, Reno said that she thought that the Pendleton Act um, could be revised. Do you have a, an opinion on that? Uh, I do, but I don't think I should state it. I don't think it's the FBI director's business as to what a statute uh, should be instead of what it is. I mean, we enforce whatever laws you pass. Um, I really don't think it's good for at least this FBI director to be giving you his opinion on on the statutes or how they should be changed. I've never done that with uh, legislation except on technical areas that go to our uh, capacity to perform our uh, so technical even, mission. Even technical changes? You don't want to comment on any technical changes? No, sir. 
Okay, I think my time is up. I'll Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, we are about to uh, entertain our last questioner of the day, and I really apologize, Director Free, for you having to come back tomorrow, and, uh, but we'll try to expedite it as quickly as possible. Get you out. Should, should I bring my lunch tomorrow? Uh, hopefully we'll have you out by noon, but uh, you might bring a snack. Okay. okay. That's correct. No, we're going to conclude on our side, and we'll start with you in the morning. Mr. Chairman, um, you stated that we finish at 5.30. We have 10 I more minutes. I will exceed your wish. We will end on your side and start on ours in the morning. We'll, we'll have one more on your side because you're such a nice fellow. Mr. Uh, I appreciate Hayes. that. <clears throat> this has been a very interesting day to, to observe, and that's basically what a lot of us have done. And I, I think that we've had two extraordinarily gracious people come before the committee, both uh, the Attorney General and yourself. And I've been intrigued by what I think is a difficult situation for both of you. But I'm left with tremendous conflicts uh, by hearing both of you, both in terms of your own comments separately and then comparing them. I wrestle with the fact that basically we've had over 65 people involved in this whole issue who have either taken the Fifth uh, Amendment, uh, asserting their Fifth Amendment privilege 42. Some of them have been former government officials. We've had 12 witnesses who've left the country and we've had 12 foreign witnesses who have refused to cooperate, and then we've had many people who simply have no lapse of memory. This isn't a tiny issue. It does involve, candidly, uh, fundraising on both sides of the aisle, and I think ultimately this has to lead to campaign finance reform besides holding people accountable. The question that I'm wrestling with is that I think that the way the Attorney General has read our campaign laws, she's made them almost meaningless. And now the way she's reading the independent counsel law, she's made it almost meaningless. When you talk about the fact that you uh, have a 10-year appointment, I get satisfied. And then you say, but the president can fire me any time. So have me reconcile those two things. Well, they're both, uh, they're both facts. Uh, we assume in the fact that Congress gave the director a 10-year term and a president signed that is that there was a decision made it's a decision that certainly could be changed, but a decision was made that because of the uniquely uh, sensitive uh, requirements of investigations that the chief uh, investigator, not the chief law enforcement attorney, should have some insulation but, from but, but political but interference, which is what Senator Byrd said on the basically record. Basically can fire you, is what you said, unless Of you course can. he can. And so what insulation is that? <laughs> I don't find that insulation. And, and it, to me, strikes at the very reason why we're here today. He can fire you any time. He can fire the Attorney General any time. And when you say that you're subpoenaing inf information from the White House and that more or less they've been cooperative or you'd like it to have taken less time, it seems to me that you're subpoenaing information from the White House, that they have information about activity in the White House and activity that may relate. Isn't that... Uh, begin to make one think that you trigger the independent counsel? For those who are charged with the responsibility of triggering it or not triggering it, I mean, they have to take into consideration all of the relevant facts and circumstances. If that's one of them, they certainly have to consider that. But, but you, you know... You have, you have, uh, you have um, Ron Carey, head of the, the Teamsters. We were supposed to protect the election. You have very serious allegations that the DNC can found ways to have people contribute to his campaign, and you have uh, information that uh, uh, Deemsters clearly contributed to the DNC, and a sense of uh, concern about conspiracy involving high government officials. Mr. Kerry, the government is saying can't run again, and it would seem to me that you would at least trigger, uh, under the independent counsel statute, uh, a preliminary investigation, and that hasn't happened. So I'm really left very uncomfortable by this dialogue. Furthermore, um, when you were asked from one to 10, Mr. Lantos is a very smart man. He didn't ask you to pin that number down because I think he got the gist of it. But uh, I would clearly gather from your uh, testimony uh, saying that you really believed in it, that it was closer to a 10 than a five. Is that accurate? 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't give it a number. I would say, as I said before, it was a recommendation that I firmly believed. I would not have made it if I thought it was not a strong one. So you firmly believed in that recommendation? Yes, sir. The, um, the bottom line is you also did something that I think is unusual, uh, and that is that you put in writing uh, your strong conviction about this. Uh, that's, that's a very, uh, very certain thing. Someday we're all going to see that document. It's in writing. Why did you put it in writing? Because it was a, seri enough, a serious enough issue that required uh, a lot of thought, a lot of analysis, and uh, I thought it should be done in a, uh, a thorough and comprehensive way. I mean, I, it's not infrequent that I write uh, memos uh, similar to that. Well, but not about an issue dealing with the White House and potential corruption of, of, of the person who appointed you. That, that's not insignificant. And I would just uh, conclude by saying it also is significant. Someone in the Justice or in the FBI wanted us to know that you had it in writing and you disagreed. And that's really the reason why we're here today. And I thank you. And I found your response to be very candid to both sides. And I think I will also say to you that I have friends on both sides of the aisle who say that you, in fact, have been the best director ever to be in the FBI and that the FBI has had taken many hits over the last few years. And you've unfortunately been having to take some of the repercussions of it, but high marks from many people that I know and respect. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to go back a little bit to the, uh, the meeting that involved um, the White House, and I think it was Madeleine Albright, maybe I'm wrong, prior to your, following your trip to Egypt. There was a request, or there was a discussion of documents here. Can you, can you give us a little scenario of what, what the documents were going to be used for? I think this is sort of hanging in the air, that there may have been some nefarious purpose that these documents were given to the White House. Why, why were they given to the White House? The request for the material was to prepare a briefing for the Secretary of State who was about to travel outside the United States. So it wasn't in any way to tip off anybody inside the White House of allegations pertaining to Chinese influence or anything like that. Is that, is that correct? The request, as I understood it, was for the preparation of the Secretary of State. However, uh, those documents and the information contained in those documents would have been disseminated through the White House Counsel's Office. That's where the request came from. And that's where your, your concern came from? Yes, sir. Okay. When you voiced your concern, how did that become public? Was that, did you do that publicly? No, absolutely not. Uh, I don't know how it became public. Do you know whether it became public from someone at the FBI or did it become public from someone at the White House? I don't know. Okay. The, the second issue pertains to the memorandum. Uh, again, this was a memorandum that you sent to the Attorney General. You have testified that you wrote it yourself, four copies, as I recall. Um, again, there was obviously a leak, not of the document itself, apparently, but of the information within the document. The, the reason I raise those two issues uh, is, in all frankness, um, I expect politicians to leak documents, okay? Uh, I, get, I get much more nervous uh, when the leaks are coming in the context of law enforcement um, because I expect a higher standard. And I think you've done an excellent job, so I'm not criticizing you, but, but I'm, I'm curious as to whether you're concerned uh, where we have two incidents following upon each other quite closely where, where obviously we have a leak uh, that, that concerns me. I'm very concerned about it, too. Unfortunately, I wish those were the only two. I could cite you if we had a couple of hours. Uh, many other instances where confidential criminal justice uh, matters, confidential national security matters are uh, uh, finding their ways onto uh, uh, newspapers. Uh, it's the most frustrating thing uh, about being in this job. Uh, and it's not just in this case. It's a, it's a horrible situation. It's one that I deplore. I've taken many steps internally uh, to try to stop it, including telling people that they will be fired uh, and prosecuted. If I can find that, I conduct inquiry leaks uh, uh, by the dozens. Unfortunately, few of them are resolved. Uh, there is not a more frustrating part of this job in Washington, I can tell you, uh, than the leaks that uh, we routinely see. Well, I appreciate that because I, again, I think that that is a, a, a 
bad sign, and I, I'm not trying to be critical of you at all, but I think in law enforcement, and I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican, I think we all would agree that law enforcement leaks are, are a very serious matter. Um, so I, I appreciate your hearing that. And I, and I say that because I think, frankly, it is fair game um, for the majority side, uh, if they have the information, um, to, to raise the information. Uh, I, I agree with that. Uh, but I don't think that it should be a cover-up situation within your agency. But I, but I agree with the comments that you have made and the comments uh, that the Attorney General made. If, if you write a memo and you cannot be confident that it's going to be private, uh, you're going to be far less likely to do so. Uh, in terms of, of the number of memos you, you've written, uh, can you give us more of a, a rundown of how often you use memoranda? You know, on a, on a weekly basis, uh, I mean, I don't always write them myself. I didn't write this whole memorandum either. I reviewed it and revised it. I would say probably maybe a couple of dozen a week that I sign that go to all different agencies of the government, including the Attorney General and the Department of Justice. So although this is a serious matter, it was not extraordinary that you wrote a memorandum? No. Okay. Um, also, you've been asked whether, and, and the question I think was very cleverly put to you about whether you have ever had it in uh, investigation where there has been a disagreement between the United States Attorney General and the Director of the FBI that alleged a conspiracy against the White House. And obviously the answer is no, because it's sort of the, the question defines itself. Uh, and I, I think we should point that. I think you, the same question could have asked, been asked, uh, have you ever had a disagreement when there's a president who has a, sock, a cat named Sox? Uh, because there, there just hasn't been one. So I think that, that, that we have to be careful that when we talk about how unusual this is, um, what has happened between you and the Attorney General, it's because it's an unusual situation, not because something nefarious has happened. Do you think that Attorney General Reno bowed to political pressure in deciding not to have an independent prosecutor? I think she made uh, the best decision that she thought uh, uh, she could make under the facts and circumstances and the law as she had it. I have totally, uh, total respect for her decision. So you don't think politics came into play at all? No. Thank you. I have no further questions. The gentleman's time has expired. The committee has written questions which it will submit to all the witnesses and without objection the committee record will remain open to receive the answers to our questions. Tomorrow's schedule will be, we'll start at 10 a.m. Uh, we really appreciate the Director Free coming back at 10. We'll try to get him to uh, con conclude his uh, testimony by noon, if it's at all possible, so he can get home to his six kids? Five and a half. Five and a half children. And uh, then we will then have our next witness. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Director Free, we stand in recess till 10 in the morning. Later this morning, we'll have day two of this week's House campaign fundraising investigation hearing. FBI Director Free will testify beginning at 10 a.m. on our companion network, C-SPAN 2. And you can see the day's proceedings beginning at 8 p.m. here on C-SPAN. And this morning, we continue with our live coverage of the National Transportation Safety Board meeting in Baltimore. They resume their investigation into the crash of TWA Flight 800. You can see the hearing Wednesday morning at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific time on C-SPAN.